Hi everyone and welcome to the Think Before You Do part two video where we're going to work through an example of a pre-registration. And the aim of today's lecture is just to give you a hands-on example of what's involved in a pre-registered report and how you can work through the reproducible research checklist and apply this checklist to your own work in your dissertation. So today's example is actually going to be from one of my PhD projects, which looks at the association between pubertal development and adolescent depression. So having a framework to, to use when drafting up my pre-registration as part of my PhD has made the whole process so much easier and there's been a very clear like checklist to follow and yeah I definitely recommend following this format um, in, in your own research project and thankfully there are so many options available to help you you know kind of design a uh, pre-registration so the open science framework has a wonderful collection of resources and there are so many different templates regardless of what kind of project you're doing so if it's data collection based secondary data analysis a qualitative study so there's so much that you can use to so much that you can use um, to help you kind of along your way and these links here will kind of be able to provide you with the resources after the lecture and you can have a look at them in your own time but for the purposes of today's example, I'm going to kind of focus more on a quantitative project for a secondary data analysis based project, which is the kind of project that I was doing. But at the same time, this checklist can be applied to any project you do. So you know, as we go through this checklist, just keep in mind how you might apply these kind of methods and this framework to your own research. So first of all, you know, the first two items on this checklist really kind of situate your research project and allow you to get started. So the first one is, you know, what's my general research question? And then what are my specific, concise and testable hypotheses? So before you kind of decide upon your research question and your hypotheses, it's important that you kind of decide upon a project title and then also provide a brief description. So this can be like an abstract length piece of writing on the kind of background to your project why it's important to undertake this piece of research uh, and then once you've established those you can list your research question so for example in 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 my case here my research question was is pubertal timing associated with depressive symptoms during adolescence and then my hypothesis kind of following on from this so my null hypothesis was that there is no association between pubertal timing and depression in adolescence and then my first hypothesis was that early pubertal timing is associated with increased depressive symptoms in adolescence so this is a few things to note here so it's good practice to only use two concepts per research question so you might have a couple of research questions in your dissertation but you know having this two concept kind of rule really does make it a lot easier for you to kind of I suppose decide upon your research question and the relationship you want to study but then it's also much much easier then to de design as or to kind of decide upon a statistical test that you'll use to to test this hypothesis um, and also you can see here in my um, my first hypothesis that I've made the kind of directionality of this association or the association that I hypothesize quite clear so I'm saying that early pubertal timing is associated with increased depressive symptoms so you know it re really is important that you give as much information as possible because this will kind of you know set the tone going forward for the rest of your project. So once you've decided upon your research questions and your hypotheses, how are you going to kind of go about, you know, testing, testing these hypotheses and, and, and what sort of sample are you going to use and how are you going to design the study? So, um, yeah, the next step then is your study design. So this section can vary a lot depending on the nature of your project, but the key is to give as much detail as possible. And, you know, in, in my case, I'm working with a um, big kind of longitudinal cohort study in the US. And, you know, so, so like I know that kind of going into this project, I don't have any control on the kind of type of sample that I'm using. But, you know, there's still really kind of key points of information that you do need to include. So and the type of data. So you can see here that the 
data set I'm working with, the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study or the ABCD study, it's a longitudinal cohort. So already, you know, you know, okay, well, this is the kind of data I'm working with. I've given some general content of the data set. So I've said that it's, you know, based in the US, it has neuroimaging, biological and behavioral measures. And, you know, let's say, for example, I could provide further detail here about, you know, how did I access the data? What sort of approvals did I have? So these, so this part of the pre-registration will vary depending on the type of project you're using. But you can have a chat to your supervisor and kind of look at existing kind of papers that, that might be similar or use a similar data set to you. Um, but again, it's just about really being transparent and, and kind of providing as much detail as you can. So you can see here, there's some further information on, on what sort of information you might want to include if it's a data collection or a qualitative project. So once you've decided upon the study design, um, it, you need to kind of, you know, then think about, okay, well, what sort of sample am I going to use? And obviously this does depend on the kind of project that you're doing. So the sample might already be available if you're doing secondary data analysis, which was the case for me, but you know, you might also have to collect your own data. So there are kind of follow on questions then that we might need to consider if that were the case. So, you know, my sampling plan here is telling the reader, okay, well, I'm going to use an unrelated subsample of the ABCD participants. And then I'm telling the reader, okay, how many participants am I actually going to be using and what's the total sample size? And, you know, like there are some things that are important to, to, to pay attention to here. Um, and one of them that I'll just kind of draw your attention to um, briefly is, is power analysis. So this is a very important aspect of experimental design and it gets mentioned quite a lot, but I think, you know, and you can, you could probably have, you could have an entire lecture on what power analysis is. And this is something that if, you know, you guys are interested in, we can touch upon it in some of the live sessions, but just briefly, the statistical power of a hypothesis test is the probability of the te detecting an effect if there is a true et effect to detect. So, um, you know, essentially, like, is the probability of finding an effect that's there. And, you know, the power of your of your study is determined by a few different criteria. So your sample size, your effect size of interest, the significance level, which is usually set at um, 0 0.05 and if you and statistical power and if you have any of these three out of four criteria you can calculate the power of your study and power analysis is important because it allows us to determine the sample size required to detect an effect of a given size with a given degree of confidence. So it's a very important aspect of experimental design and something that you should kind of definitely be thinking about um, as part of your sampling plan. But again, I'm not going to dwell on that too much here, but we can have kind of an additional conversation about that during the live session. Um, and then, you know, this is then also related to things like your stopping rule. Okay, so like, when are you going to stop data collection? You know, what sort of inclusion and exclusion criteria? How are you going to recruit the sample? So, for example, for the ABCD study, they were, were recruited through schools and via snowballing methods across 21 sites. And you can see here, when you provide this level of detail, it then kind of informs what sort of factors you might want to consider when designing your statistical tests. Um, so it really is helping you kind of have a, you know, a, a watertight plan that makes it much, much easier to kind of execute the, the research project. So once you've decided kind of on, on, on those aspects of, of the recipe and you've kind of, you know, given as much detail as possible, we then move on to kind of the variables of interest and how they might be measured. And related to this, what sort of covariates am, am I going to use and what's my rationale for including them? And also there are so many, you know, different aspects of the data that we might be working with like what are we going to do if there's missing data what if the distribution of my data is skewed what if there are outliers present and these are all the things that you know we need to think about in advance to make our research reproducible so that others know exactly the approach we took when we were 
designing this project but also for your future self so when you go uh, to this when you get to the writing up stage you're able to go back and have a look at okay well you know I included this covariate for this reason and this is my variable of interest and here is the measure that I used so again it's just really being very kind of methodical about your your methods um, and how you detail what you're doing so starting with variables so this is one of the most important section of the pre-registration and you know this ingredient the kind of I suppose detail in this aspect or this ingredient of our recipe can significantly affect the reproducibility of your study and often you know this is where a lot of research studies can fall down because there just isn't enough detail for someone to come along and follow your recipe and try and reproduce your study so you know, for example, here, I'm telling the reader my independent variable is pubertal timing and my dependent variable is depressive symptoms. And like, there's quite a lot of, of text here and I just wanted to include as much as possible just to give you kind of an indication of like how much detail you might want to include. But you can have and you can have a read through this in your own time. But there's just a f- few couple of things I want or a few things that I'd like to to highlight so for example here you know in my independent variable we know immediately that the pubertal development scale is the measure that I'm using what kind of measure is this well I've told the reader that it's five items on a four point scale and you know then I go on to tell the, to, to, to say, OK, well, I'm going to use a total score instead of an average. So the reader knows exactly how I've calculated my the score that I'm going to use in my models. And then also, you know, were there multiple reports? Was there a child report or a caregiver report? You know, what one was I going to use? Um, and again, you know, it's just about really being transparent and kind of having a step-by-step guide about how you generated the final cleaned variable that you used in your models and ideally alongside this kind of text in your manuscript or in your dissertation you will provide a link to the code that you used for data cleaning. So the code is really useful here because it means that you have a a blueprint that you can follow in your write-up and then if there's any kind of ambiguity or, or or uncertainty um, in once you get to your statistical analysis you can go back and you know exactly how you process your data so you know I applied a similar approach to the dependent variable depressive symptoms and again just telling the reader exactly how I created um, the measures and you know how that then um, informed the later models so thinking of the cake and the recipe do I have enough detail here for someone else to reproduce this study and kind of continuing on um, with variables so you know a lot of the time when we think about our research study we just think about our predictor and our outcomes or or independent variable and our dependent variable and our covariates so normally these are things like age race kind of socioeconomic status variables they just kind of get lumped into our model kind of and sometimes forgotten about And, and there's kind of growing there's kind of a growing discussion on the need to pay more attention to your covariates because in your linear regression your covariate has as much weight as your as your independent variable so we really need to think about you know why are we including these covariates in our models so for example in the case of my study my covariates were age ethnicity body mass index and study site and i've just included one example of a rationale for including BMI is a covariate but I would do this for each of my covariates in turn and I would also describe you know what measure I used in the same level of detail that I used for the independent and dependent variables and then you know there might be missing data in your data set so how are you going to account for that so in my case I'm going to use complete case analysis to deal with missing data because my sample is so large and I can afford to exclude some people but this mightn't be the case for you so again just think about okay well what will I do if I don't have all the measures for one participant and these are conversations that you can kind of have with your with your supervisor you can also do some independent research but just the important thing is is that you think about these decisions in your research plan before you start your analysis and then similarly with skewed data you know what will I do if my data violates the normality distributions for linear regression so in my case I'm going to use a log 10 transformation but this might differ depending 
depending on your research study so you know the idea here is that like if you encounter all of like you know if you go on to encounter any of these decisions later on in your analysis you know exactly what you need to do and there's transparency and you know it does take a lot of pressure off you know those kind of analytical decisions that you need to make later on and the same goes for outliers so you know i'm going to use a sensitivity analysis for my outliers but you know there are lots of decisions that you know you're making here in advance that will really save your future self when you get to the analysis stage and again it's just about giving yourself the time and yeah that might be front loading the work a little bit but it does really create a very clear plan for you to follow later on so yes really really think about why you're including these as covariates and they really do need as much attention as your iv and dv so you know when you are thinking about designing your research study do think about your covariates as well Okay, so moving towards the end of our research checklist now. So, and arguably these are kind of the, the two points that I suppose can be the most daunting in your research project. So, you know, what statistical tests will I use to test my hypotheses? And then also what criteria will I use to make inferences about what my data is telling me? And before we go into the example, I just kind of wanted to, to spend a minute or so discussing the different kinds of criteria that we can use as researchers to make inferences. So um, for example, p-values, so you're likely familiar with, with these. So this is a probability that your data would have occurred by chance and the smaller the p-value, the better. Um, but p-values alone don't tell us enough about the strength of the relationship between two variables of interest. So it is better to supplement p-values with other metrics, and this provides further context for our, for the interpretation of our results. So for example, we might want to use effect sizes. So this is the strength of the relationship between two variables, and it's usually measured um, using Cohen's D, but we also might use beta coefficients in the regression. Um, and then also confidence intervals. Um, so this helps us kind of determine how representative our sample is of the population we are studying. So the confidence interval is a range of values that's likely to include a population value. This is usually the population mean um, with a certain degree of confidence. So we usually set this at 95%. So you can see that by providing more than one kind of inference criteria, it really gives you as a researcher kind of more tools to to help kind of you know decide how meaningful are my results and are they representative of the population I'm trying to study and this would be really helpful for writing up your discussion but then also it just provides more transparency for the reader so they know how you came to kind of decide upon the conclusions that you're going to going to have in your discussion. So this, as I said, is perhaps the most important and sometimes most complicated question within the pre-registration. So in the case of my example, so my relationship of interest is how pubertal timing is associated with depressive symptoms. So some points to note here. So we need to include the type of model. So you can see here, my model is a general linear model, and that's what I'm going to use to test the association. And I've also told the reader that I'm going to use the GLM function in R. And then, you know, what, what are my model specifications? I've told the reader here what my predictor is, what my outcome is, you know, how am I going to correct for multiple comparisons? Because, you know, if we're running multiple tests over and over again, the chance of committing a type one error increases. So this is why we need to control for multiple comparison. And you might be familiar with the Bonferroni method. And here I'm just using a different kind of family-wise error correction method. But the, but the principle is the same and it's just about being as transparent as possible. So ideally we would include the code here for the analysis. And you know this would be reported then in your manuscript. And this allows the reader to see like, exactly what you, what you did. And you know the kind of detail that we include here is so handy when, you're, when you go about writing your code in R because you need to include like what's your predictor variable, what are your outcomes, what are your covariates. So you're really doing a lot of this work in advance. And then again, kind of the inference criteria. So I'm telling the reader here that I'm going to make inferences about the associations between pubertal timing and depression based on p-values and the size of the regression coefficient. And I also could have put in some confidence intervals here as well. 
And then I'm telling the reader that I'll conclude that a regression analysis supports our hypothesis if the p-value is smaller than 0 0.01 and the regression coefficient is larger than our minimum, minimum effect size of interest. And that's something that I would generate from my power analysis. So the analyses here are your confirmatory analyses, but you can also include some exploratory analysis as well. And it just needs to be reported as so. So if you've done your confirmatory analysis and you come across a relationship that might be of interest, you can go and explore that. And I think it is important to highlight that pre-registration doesn't stifle creativity. It just creates accountability. And it means that you have your confirmatory analysis and then you have your exploratory analysis. And there's a very clear distinction between the two. So kind of drawing to a close, the main takeaway point from today's lecture is just to keep this question in your mind as you walk through your research project and your dissertation. So does my recipe have enough information for someone else to make the research study? And I think if you keep this question at the back of your mind while you're kind of going through each of the steps in the reproducible research checklist, you really will create a robust plan that you can follow and and you know you can kind of hopefully make the dissertation process that little bit less stressful for you and um, but we'll be holding a live session anyway to kind of run through any questions you might have but if you do have any questions in the meantime please feel free to to email us and reach out to myself laura or alex we'd be happy to answer any of your questions and thanks very much for listening